Three up, two across, tap that play button three times and walk through the archway into Dialogue Alley. And welcome to Dialogue Alley, a podcast about Harry Potter books, book translations, and all other things magical. I'm Melanie. I'm Eric. I'm Carly. The three of us are Harry Potter book translation collectors. And what that means is we collect the books in all different languages. We have the books in Italian and German and in... Greenlandic. And in... Nepali. and Icelandic and Asturian, all sorts of other really crazy cool dialects from all over the world. And we are here with our podcast talking about those things. So if you are new to this podcast, welcome. We are so happy to have you here. Um, We love chatting about all these different Harry Potter books and all of the books from all over the world. And if you're not new to our podcast, welcome back. We're so happy that you're here. Yay. So for today's episode, we have something that we are so spectacularly excited about. So for the first time, we have a major guest on Dialogue Alley, and he is here to talk about not his typical thing. Um, I don't know, guys, should I say who it's going to be or should I leave it as a surprise for the main segment? I think we can say who it is, because when you say we have a major guest, we've had some major guests on here. But we have. Like um, our community, we have yes. had some major some major guests. This is yeah. not our typical guest. Um, and we're talking about Stan Yanevsky is going to be on our podcast today. <laughs> and if you don't know who so that cool. is, uh, he's Victor Crumb, guys. In the movies, he's Victor Crumb. That's Super crazy. excited. I'm excited. And I'm so excited because he's here to talk to us about Bulgarian Harry Potter books. And that's... Awesome, because I feel like that's not something he usually talks about. So, so cool. How fun is that? (laughs) (laughs) All right. So why don't we do a little bit of quick news? This way we can get straight to that main segment. So in the news, we have a few things that are going on. Not too much, I guess. But I guess the thing that I'm super duper excited about is the new Estonian cover. Harry Potter book six came out and it is a really beautiful purple. Oh, my goodness. And I really do. I've heard people say that they really don't care for the new Estonian books. They don't care for the covers, but I really do like them. That is a set. Well, I'm going to get all the sets at some point. We all know this. (laughs) But (laughs) that is a set that even. Even if I weren't, you know, trying to get all the things in the course of my lifetime, um, this is a set that I'd still want to own. And I'm probably going to try to talk Eric into it at some point. And I don't know because I go because I don't know. I'm I'm not as excited about the new Estonian covers as I think you are, because uh, I I don't know, like. It's not I'll like wear the, you down. It'll be fine. I know you. Maybe you can try, but it's not like the new Thai <laughs> books or the Slovak books. No, like these are no, very. These are a lot these are very, modern. Yeah, they're yeah, very yeah. modern. They're very simple. I would say. Um, yes, they are. It's a nice departure, though, from the really ornate art we've been seeing, and I really yes. like that because we've been seeing really floral or really flowery or ornate and gaudy and busy, and I love those too. Don't get me wrong. But this is just very elegant, right? Like you look at the book, it has some big symbols on the book that relate to Harry Potter. So we know what the books are without even reading the titles. We know what they are. I think that is so clever the way it was done. The colors are really beautiful of the books. They're really nice hardcovers on top of that. I'm just a giant fan. So anyway, Harry Potter book six is out and it's a purple that we've not seen. We've seen purple and all over the world and like Azkaban and dif- different books have had purple covers, but this is actually really nice purple. Like, a, and I'm not a purple person, but I really like this one. So I'm very excited about it. I do like the color purple that they chose. It is, like you said, it's different than anything that we've had before. And um, I mean, it's just, if, if you do have these on your shelf, 
it's nice to have the spines that are these different colors, which I think is the right. coolest part about these the set. It almost reminds me of the German Rainbow books just because the, yeah. the set itself, it has so many different colors that it just looks cool when it's all together. I was thinking it reminded me of the German Rainbow box set or like the Bloom's very gift editions that I call jelly beans because yeah. of all the different colors. Yeah. So very well done. Very well, I think, coordinated. I can't wait to see what they do with the rest of them. Um, what else do we have? There's a, the Kibwishi box set. Oh, that's right. That The French? Wasn't it French or no? No, yeah. no. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Kazakh. Is it Kazakh? There's a Kazakh. Kazakh. Kaz uh, yeah, we were reading in so for those who don't know, we have a Discord for our Patreon members or Patreon members. And I was reading a post in the Discord from one of our members talking and and posted a video of the new Kazakh box set. Another one of the members goes, Well, did they complete it? I only know of like one through three. And they completed oh, wow. all seven books, apparently. And it's a really interesting box set. It opens from the top. Instead of oh, like yeah, from okay. the sides. Yeah, I was oh, thinking of something totally it's... different. Now I'm on your, now. Yeah. Yep, you're good. Yeah, now you're on, on the same page. I'm on the train now. Here we go. Is it still <laughs> Brian Selznick? Like, is it still that artwork? I or believe so. Art? I didn't, I think it's the same. Yeah, I don't, I think I don't know about I, the art. I think it's the same. I paid more attention to the opening of the box rather than the actual cover art. But it's very interesting. The patron member who posted it said he didn't really care much for the way the box works because it does hide the books on the shelf. You know, you don't just see the beautiful spines that we're all such a fan of. But at the same time, it opens in a really cool way. And I'll probably have to buy that one, too. Well, if you but, display your uh, Harry Potter books on a table, maybe it would be cool. I mean... I suppose <laughs> have them as my coffee table thing. Like, and I'm probably like me being me, I'd have people come over and be like, look guys, look, look at how this box set opens. And they'd be like, we're going home. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm because... just interested to see like what the cover art's going to look like. Cause if it's new, unique cover art, then obviously I'm going to need it. But if it's, if it's Brian Selznick, then I don't need it. Right. No, I think it's Brian Selznick and it's and it's one through seven, which is cool that they completed it, right? Like yeah. and they did it so quietly. That that's the thing. Like there were no big yay, we're done. It was just like done. And now they have a box. Well, and speaking of things that I don't need, um <laughs> we've we've seen we've seen listings for a while about like the US anniversary box set, and we've speculated what that might entail. And I don't know if this is a hundred percent true, but some of the images I'm seeing now that are going along with these listings that I've seen posts I've seen posted it is like literally a a new box like the box is a little bit different but it's just the books 1 through 7 with the Mary Grand Prey art bummer really and like no cards no extra stuff I mean they even did something for the 10th and the 15th anniversary of course and the 20th, 20th. Right? I know like, like that's for, very new... anticlimactic it is. Yeah. So I'm I'm really hoping that there is more and these are just images that, you know, are just kind of placeholders, but who knows? Maybe it is. Maybe this is it. And, and I don't it. have to buy something. Yeah, I mean, I get to save money. If that's the case, I'm not buying it, which is strange because of all these like that anniversary, so weird. All, all these anniversary yeah. sets that we've bought, I'm not going to buy the one from the country I live in. Like that's the weirdest. The easiest one with yeah. free shipping. <laughs> yeah. The one I can literally drive my car less than four minutes to a store and buy. I'm not exactly going to buy. like I'm in the same boat, but I mean, if it just has one of those stamps that says 25th on the jacket, well, I can get neater stamps from Universal Orlando and I already did. Like, you know, I, 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 I'm, that's very anticlimactic. At, at the very said. least, I would hope that they would include like extra pages like they did for the UK anniversary yeah, book. Yeah, where they included out. different art. Like I would, if the, even if the covers were the same and it just had the stamp on it, but they included different internal art from Mary Grand Prey over the years, I would grab that so fast. Right. Because I love I think we all art. Yeah, even yeah, just extra prop, extra huh? pages with more information, right? Like the yeah. UK one, the Bloomsbury one had more info, like about the original art on the back of the Thomas Taylor. Or book. about the um, houses, you know, yeah, it talked about exactly. if when we were doing house editions, it talked about the houses. The 25th, like you said, talked about Thomas Taylor and how the, you know, the young wizard on the back came to be, right? And then how they transitioned to the older, you know, Dumbledore guy. Um, so, yeah. 
I would definitely, I would read, I read all of those when they came out. That's, it's very good content. It's very fun. And I would read that if I even, even if Scholastic told how they got the book published, it's in the Arrington bibliography, but how Scholastic, how, um, oh, the guy from Scholastic, whose name I've forgotten. Arthur um, yeah, how Arthur Levine came to find the Harry Potter books was incredible. It's a fun story. And I think it would be really fun to include it here, even in the 25th, even if it is published elsewhere. It'd be, it's not widely known, and it is a really fun story. And without his intuition, we wouldn't have had the book. I mean, somebody, uh, some other publisher may have snapped it up, or snapped it up but, you right. know, it I wouldn't think... have been scholastic. We wouldn't have had the Grand Prix art, potentially. Like, it would be a whole different everything, so I think, I think something like that would even be worthy to include. Yeah, I think we should. I think we should honestly have like a whole episode discussing like what we would like to see. Ooh, I like that. Twenty fifth anniversary because there are so many things that I'd be so happy with that would also be like cheap options. Honestly, yeah. Because I feel like I feel like putting a stip a sticker on books that already exist is like such a cop-out kind of thing, right. especially yeah. considering they can do that on printings that are available now. And it's not really giving us something new. And people like us, who are the people that are going to be buying anniversary edition books, like are going to be turned off by something like that. So, right. You're going to lose your intended buyer. Um, yeah. I think it would be a really good idea for us to come up with like a whole episode on our speculations and maybe someone, we, we would have put it so out. much fun with that. I think it'd be interesting. We have an episode like what you're talking about and then we publish it and then we tag Scholastic in all of our socials. I know. <laughs> I think it just needs to be in the universe. Like we just have to throw it out there and hope that the right person hears it. Um, yeah. And that happens literally all the time. I think to Guys, summarize this new segment, like if there's nothing, if there's nothing new, I'm not buying it. No new content. <laughs> I'm not buying it. And that I think that's the end of the news. Yeah, I okay. think I think we have such an exciting main segment. I think we need to wrap it up and move it on. I c agree. All right. So for the main segment on today's episode, we are joined by a very special guest. You may know him as Victor Crum from the Harry Potter Goblet of Fire movie. It is Stan. Yes. Hello, hello. everybody. And we were just talking about your last name, Stan, and which which your last name is Yanevsky. But I do think it was interesting what you were saying about the first letter of your last name, because that actually really applies to like our book collecting translations and how different countries transliterate and change spellings of things based on like a phonetic alphabet. So I don't know, would you be able to talk about that really briefly? Uh, yes. Well, my surname is primarily spelt um, different in different areas of the world. I've seen it with a Y, Yanovsky, you know, starting with a Y, with an I, with a J. Um, also my forename, uh, I've heard, um, you know, I've seen it being Stanislas, Stan is love and um, Stan is love, as uh, <laughs> once they said um, over in the in the US. So yeah, different ways of spelling my name, but it's still the same person, me. Well, good, because we're glad that you're here because um, it's very, very exciting to talk to you. I think you're the first person from a movie that we've had on the show, which is really cool. And um, I think to kick it off, I mean, I know your story about how you got the role. I read an interview that you did way back in 2005. So you were a lot younger. I think it was right at the at the premiere. Um, but before we even get to the movie, I think the three of us are mostly curious, first off, about just like what was your first experience with Harry Potter in general? Like, was it a book? Was it a movie? Um, where were you living at the time? Kind of like, where were you when that whole Harry Potter phenomenon kind of took off? Um, well, you need to, uh, well, we need to go back in time quite a bit. Um, and remember, uh, a lot of people seem to forget that back when we got cast for the fourth movie, we had only two films out. So it right. was a very, very fresh thing. And books were um, still getting written. So the whole hype wasn't quite peaking at that time. So nobody really knew 
how huge this was uh, going to get. I was in London and I got scouted by one of the casting agents. And the funny thing is that Harry Melling, who plays Dudley, is from the same school that I came. So they had two Harry Potter um, so-called stars. <laughs> was there just like a movie scout walking around the campus of your school? Like, how did that work out that you were both at the same school? Well, he was already uh, in in the first two movies. Okay, uh, well, right. But yes, they were um, scouting. They had um, you know casting agents going to different schools and just searching um, for um, the right people, uh, as well as having normal castings, uh, actors approaching and you know applying for roles. Uh, so yeah, I was uh, literally late for an um, afternoon registration. I was, you know, being. Um, being a boy back in the days, playing laptops and all. So I was late uh, running through a corridor with a friend of mine, trying to come up with an excuse uh, to excuse ourselves um, from detention. And that's when I bumped into Fiona Weir, who is one of the casting agents, uh, well, was uh, back back then. Uh, bumped into her, um, she looked at me and, you know, she was with the head of drama. Uh, who later uh, found me and yeah, kick off, it kicked off from there. So that was my very first experience connected to Harry Potter. I hadn't uh, seen it or read the books. So uh, my first experience was bumping into one of the casting agents of the movie. And well, so did you have to tell that excuse to somebody that you were late because like, did they buy that excuse? I'm sorry, I'm late. I was uh, asked to be in a, to audition for a movie. Well, I think um, we came up with some uh, more legit sort okay. of excuse. Um, at the time, we were actually playing a computer game. Um, so <laughs> that was the real reason. Uh, but yeah, we didn't get off detention. Obviously, had to uh, copy all the school rules. And, Man. You know. <laughs> Even being but, in a... You know, uh, I, I call this being in the right place at the right time. So I was meant to be late and bump into the casting agent. And, you know, as I like to joke, I was born to be Victor Crumb. Yes, absolutely. Well, and how, and I read this in the interview also, there were like over 600 people in Bulgaria that were also auditioning for this role, but you happened to be found in, in England. And that is that true? I think, um, I think uh, quite a few uh, more than 600. I think they were casting in four different countries. Wow. And uh, yes, uh, they found me in London, uh, and they didn't know I was Bulgarian until That's they had so to book funny. my first. Uh, it is that is my like first ticket. That is absolutely like right place, right time. Like, yep. As I said, crazy. born to be Victor Crumb. Crazy. Um, <laughs> so after you got this role in the Goblet of Fire movie, or even before you started shooting, did you start reading the books? Did you go back and watch the first two movies? Like what? Were you instructed to do any of this, like kind of background knowledge building, or did? Well, you um, once we get cast, we obviously um, get the script. So that was the very first thing I read, and after reading the script, um, I got you know excited to know more about the story. Went, got um, you know, I think four books uh, were available, five. Uh, so got them watched the first two movies and got myself familiar um, with the whole story. It's, and like, what were your initial impressions? I mean, like, that's got to be difficult to balance, like just super excitement of being in a movie that you know is going to be really popular. And then like, just trying to quickly understand like, well, what's happened up to this point in the movie I'm going to be in? Well, oh, yes, it was very exciting. And um, I remember reading through the lines, trying to find, uh, if Victor Crumb would start speaking at some point, uh, as we know, he doesn't talk much. So uh, it was very exciting, actually. I remember everyone was super excited, waiting for each new book to come out and see how their characters would um, develop. Uh, so, yeah, Victor Crumb didn't die in the fourth film. So I was, you know, I couldn't wait to read the fifth book and see how much of him was in it obviously not much <laughs> and then you know waiting for each book to come out and see if we are back uh which obviously would mean that we would be back on set filming and when um deathly hallows came out victor crumb does come back yeah so excitement was um you know 
quite big. And I did come back and I did film for two weeks. So it was a little reunion. And then the scene didn't make it in the final cut. So yeah, I read that too. But that's it so bum such a bummer. Well, I found out in the cinema actually. No. Uh, so, no. Yeah. <laughs> that's yes, awful. I was I was um you know with a bunch of friends and we were very excited. And then you know the scene never came up. Uh, it was the wedding of Bill and Fleur, right. so obviously they cut it. And I found out in the cinema, and I was gutted. Um, <laughs> I couldn't believe. And then I remember uh, some media even accused me of lying that I did film. So I was like, yeah, right. You'll see. You know, some material will come out. And as it did, we saw Victor Crumb back with Hermione, and it was a very nice little reunion with everybody. As soon as the like DVD home release came out, did you show them the deleted scene? You're like, see, I told you I was in it. Well, it's not on there. It's not so on there. We didn't not? really see. No. Oh, I haven't really seen the the scene. Well, David Yates, great director, he really liked the way um, you know uh, we clicked with Emma Watson, obviously Hermione. And he created this extra story within the story. So we had a, a new love triangle uh, happening. Victor Crumb came back. He got Hermione back, made Ron super jealous. We had a new dance. Um, we were dancing besides uh, the love goods. And then Victor Crumb actually was fighting the mentors of In the Tent. Uh, so that was filmed, but we never saw it. Well, now I want to see it. I'm so bummed. I would have loved to see that too. <laughs> Yeah, it was a really cool extra scene that I would have loved to see myself. It has to exist somewhere, you would think. I would imagine it does, uh, but no one has seen it, only pictures. So, rats. Oh, well, if anyone's listening and they somehow have a connection to like find lost footage, we want to see it. Well, I feel like Stan would be the one that has that connection. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> well i don't have the scene so my connection isn't like, strong enough oh, man <laughs> stan you should just, just just like refilm it with some of your friends and just just make an exact like copy of it and then just just put it up <laughs> on your social media page this is what it was was sort of like um it would be quite a crazy thing to do yeah <laughs> so when you mentioned reading the books before you started filming for goblet of fire were you reading those books in english or in bulgarian uh, English. Okay. Have, they were in English. Have you read any of the books in Bulgarian? Uh, parts of them, uh, not entirely. Okay. And did you have any? But they are pretty, pretty well translated. Okay. Um, you know, names are correct and uh, everything is um, pretty on, on spot. Okay. Because that was going to be my next question was about how in certain translations that we've talked about on our show, specifically like Norwegian, um, the translator just took all of this liberty and changed everybody's name like everyone's name is totally different and it more reflects like local folklore and legends of norway um a and similar thing is happening in the french books uh they have a completely different set of names for the schools and the houses and all so um I've experienced uh, a bit of that around the world. I thought that was interesting with the French books as well. I read the French books, probably books one through three in 2001, 2002. And I was a little bit shocked that they changed all the school names and things. It wasn't what I was expecting. It took me a while to learn, uh, you know, Serpentar and Poudlard and all that. Yeah, <laughs> and Poudlard, I have no idea where they came too. up with that. Yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah. When, it's it's interesting how they you know they decide to change the names i mean i would have i would love to find out yeah why they didn't just take the names and use them as they are but you know it's, it's like reinventing the story in a way it was and i have no idea where they came up with some of the names i think they were given so much liberty because french translated relatively early 1998 I believe 99 is when they were starting to really translate and get into that. So I think they were given a lot more liberty than, you know, the translations that we're seeing coming out now. Well, I yeah. think that's exactly it with the Norwegian one too, is I, I don't think JK Rowling was very happy that they changed it so drastically, Carly, if I'm remembering correctly. No, I don't think so. I, I don't think she was super thrilled about it. 
But I think it was one of those kind of like with Sorcerer's Stone where she did it just because one, she wanted to get her book published, you know, in a different country, different market and so on. And the excitement of your first book being such a big hit that it's being translated and adapted in different languages and countries and so on. And I, I'm not sure how much um, liberty she had or felt like agency that she felt that she could even say no. That makes sense. Um, so oh, absolutely. And every nation has their own, um, you know, specific folklore or um, background. So I guess adapting would make it an easier uh, read for everyone. And, you know, the adaptation would, would fit their nation. Right. Especially if it's a character that's supposed to invoke some feeling like, oh, this is a terrifying creature of the night or something. And you have an equivalent of that in whatever your local lore is. That'd be easier for as long as the, the main story is still intact. I don't think um, the names matter that much. Right. Um, thinking back to the books, were you so after Goblet of Fire came out the movie and they were still releasing the other books, you said, like, you know, everyone's reading the upcoming books that's that's on set. Like, am I going to be in the next book? Um, were you around for any of those book releases, either in England or were you in Bulgaria for any of those? Like, I'm just curious to see, uh, like, what was the release yes, like? I was, I was in both. Um, I remember that there was a crazy hype and everyone was pre-ordering books and, uh, you know, they were reading them super fast in like one go. Um, yeah, I was invited to, you know, be part of the release, I think, of the Deathly Hallows Um so yeah was and was that crazy you know all the lines that was in bulgaria okay oh Oh, very cool. cool very cool um do you get the feeling that most people in bulgaria well i wouldn't say most what what language i mean most people read the book in bulgarian but like what percentage of people do you think try to read the book in english just because it's the original copy i think quite a high percentage uh because we have english in schools okay So um, a lot of them read them in English uh, as well as in Bulgarian. Uh, They might as well, you know, (laughs) if they're bilingual. Right. I mean, like a lot of my like German friends, they would just rather read them in English because they're like, I can read English and it's the original book and I don't want there to be any mistranslations, I guess. But um, it happens. Well, I think it's it's probably interesting to compare, um, you know, reading it in the original text and then the translated version. For sure. Absolutely. So I wish I could. I wish like, I could do like really well. Carly, you're the closest one. Well, I've read the Spanish book. Carly, you've read oh, the French book. Yeah. But, I read the French. Harrison's read quite a bit. It, he has um interesting opinions about different translations and such. Um, what I think is hard, like speaking to we have a lot of I work with a lot of native native Spanish speakers, and they have a very hard time reading the Spanish translation of the book, just because there are so many made up words for the English version that they're just made up words for the Spanish version too. So I would imagine that's similar in other languages as well. Uh, Yeah, especially the creatures and, you know, these specific things, magical Harry Potter world things. Uh, Yeah. I mean, especially if you have um, read and watched the original English versions uh, like myself, you know, I found it really difficult to get used to the French translation of, you know, the houses. And, um, you know, when I first heard them calling Hogwarts Pudlard, I was like, <laughs> what the hell is Pudlard, you know? <laughs> and, um, well, Serpentar is Slytherin and, you know, it comes from Serpent, I guess. So that was, yeah. But it, And it, Poof Souffle for Hufflepuff. That's one of my favorite words of all time because it's it's so almost ridiculous, but it's so fun to say. But I was super confused. I have no idea where they came from because I didn't know what they. I mean, Sipinta kind of made sense, but like Pudla uh, did not. I I have no idea where they pulled them from. That's typically Carla. That's typically one of the first chapters I flip through if I get a translation and it's written in like a Latin alphabet that I can sort of pronounce. I'll like mm-hmm. flip to that chapter where the, like it's like bolded when they're getting sorted into houses and just see oh, what yeah. they what they call what each they of the houses. Everything. Yeah. And like the Norwegian one, especially it's like you don't even know because it's they're so they're so different. 
Um, right. I think McGonagall is like McSnurp in that book or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really different. Like I was like, oh, that has to be Snape. Right. I forgot I about that. It's McSnurp, and then I think either Snape or Quirrell is like Craggle or Crangle. <laughs> like they're so they're so different. Like you you have to really. Try. I wouldn't know who anybody is reading that. I would probably be so very confused. Well, that's another. Like you can go to the very last chapter of the first book, where like the first words in English are "it was quarrel," and you, so you know which one quarrel is, and then you know which one Snape is. <laughs> but other than that, it's just really hard sometimes to figure out who's who. Oh, well, you know, with us, we we have Lord Voldemort, which is in the English version, and then we have Lord Voldemort without the T, and that's in Bulgarian. So I never figured out why they just missed out the T. So every time I hear Lord Voldemort, I'm like, um, you're actually missing a T. You know, his name is Voldemort. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, That's and such an interesting thing, too, because like we have the audiobooks, and for the first three books. Oh, there you go. There it this is. is the on, ca on cassette tape, Stan. We have it on cassette tape. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> um, Jim Zale, who did the trans, uh, who transcribed the books, he said Voldemort. That's how he originally pronounced it. And it wasn't until the movies came out, which was when book four came out, that he realized to pronounce it Voldemort because that's how they pronounced it in the movies. So that's when he kind of um, changed things up a little bit. But even um, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, they pronounce it Voldemort as well. So I, I think that... It's the French it's a, pronunciation yeah, of the it's like a, where mm -hmm. they drop the T. Yeah, I guess and it's I just see a where that, discrepancy across the board. Yeah, I could see where that would cause a lot of confusion. I always read it in my head, even in English, I always read it Voldemort without the T. But when I was talking to my friends, it was always Voldemort because I didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> well, I feel like we yes, all kind of had that. I think, you know, the Mort bit in his name is connected to death. Yes. Mort, you know in many languages means death so i don't know i prefer it with the t it sounds a lot although more sinister. with the r sounds with the r sounds more romantic but i yeah. don't know if you want to have voldemort sound romantic no voldemort <laughs> has a lot more teeth to it it sounds a lot grittier and it sounds like you can really sneer that word when you're speaking at the other not so much yeah maybe it's a mixture of dutch and some other you know, Voldemort, like mm. they have that, you know, something to in, in their names. So maybe he had a Dutch connection. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Who knows? Um, I was trying to think if I was going to ask you specifically about Goblet of Fire one more time, because it's it consists like I remember when that book came out, I was maybe. I was like 10. And I think I think the three of us always talk about how that was probably the biggest book that any of us had read at the time. And, you know, my school, there's just these kids walking around with this massive book, hundreds of pages, and they're reading this. Um, and it was one of my favorites because it was one of the first times that you get this kind of glimpse into the wizarding world outside of just uh, the United Kingdom. You know, you get to explore like from the French and then uh, wherever Durmstrang's supposed to be. They don't, we don't actually know. Right. They don't actually tell us. It's a secret. Um, they tell us somewhere from the north. Somewhere in the, the north, north. Right. We don't know. Um, but, it, you know, you get the Quidditch World Cup scene, which as a huge I, I love soccer. I'm a huge soccer fan or football for you. I don't know how you say how do you say soccer or football in Bulgarian? We say football. OK, there you go. Um, <laughs> We're wrong. So, of course, I'm I'm super into the World Cup right now. I'm doing a thing on my page. I don't know if you saw it, Stan, where I, I post the scores of all the games and I use the covers of the books to represent the country that's playing, which awesome. I, it's more for me. Like, I think it's hilarious. <laughs> um, but how cool is it that the person you get cast as is like the best fill in the blank, in this case, Quidditch player in the world? Right. Like, so forever, you're going to be like associated with the best Quidditch player in the world. Well, yeah, he's sort of the idol of Quidditch. And, um, you know, people um, believe and uh, treat me like that kind of idol uh, wherever I go. And there is a Quidditch match or a Quidditch team. They praise me like an icon. So I'm, um, 
it feels really good. It feels like, uh, of, you know, it is reality, uh, even though it's magic. You know, it's a magic game, but people do play it physically. Yeah. And I have played um, Muggle Quidditch, uh, as I call it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask. <laughs> real life Quidditch. And it, I must say, it is a very physical game. It's a mixture between rugby, American football, uh, soccer, as you said. Um, very crazy. What uh, what position did you play when you played your Muggle Quidditch game? Oh, I played my my position. Okay, and <laughs> in, in I know this is played in various different ways, but how did you have to catch the snitch in your version? Was it a person running around, or was it a ball? It was a person who had a tennis ball tied to his butt. <laughs> um, well, it, it was hanging like a yeah. tail. So. <laughs> and, you know, he was printing around the pitch. And, yeah, very, uh, you know, so many things to, to look out for. Uh, so many people, you've got three, four balls on the pitch. It's, it's pretty wild. Did you catch the snitch? Of course I did. Okay, oh God. <laughs> but did you win the game? But That's did you win the, the game or did you catch it but lost the game? Well, uh, it was Muggle Quidditch, so I only took uh, a brief part and let the others play. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so I was a spectator of, you know, of the whole thing and it was uh, really cool. And I've seen it in, um, you know, a few countries and I heard uh, there is an actual real world cup a Quidditch World Cup, and I believe last or the year before, before the pandemic, you know, the years are mixing up a little bit. Uh, the U.S. Uh, came first, so we had a yeah, giant a Quidditch tournament here. I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we had a giant Quidditch tournament. I don't know, sometime in the summer, and there were there was a full weekend when we had nothing but a lot of Quidditch injuries. <laughs> <laughs> so many doctors were like what is quidditch and we had people from hawaii and alaska and uk that were all injured playing quidditch <laughs> yep yeah. carly carly works at a, hosp uh, a hospital so she gets to see a lot of right unique injuries <laughs> yeah. come in uh but i think the, the quidditch injuries are probably the strangest in my it opinion. was and they just kept on coming <laughs> and then i finally asked one of them i was like what what's going on because i really didn't know like oh it's the quidditch world cup tournament thing and it's like, oh okay i know exactly what that is i do <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting <laughs> yeah it's quite amazing how they you know bring a, a a game that was you know made up in joe rowling's imagination to life you know it's, it's quite incredible it is pretty incredible when you think about it that she you know she created something that's now a thing and it has leagues and jerseys and kids pay money to play it's pretty awesome really i also heard at one point that they were trying to make it an official sport and bring it into the olympics so if that happens then wow you know that would be that's awesome really incredible could you imagine? And of course, going back to Victor Crumb, who's the icon of <laughs> I think, I think, I think, I think you might have to carry the flag for I, your country in the Olympics. Say. There, uh, that would be an absolute honor. Um, I want to transition quick back to to books, and then I actually do want to talk about some things that you're currently working on now, or different appearances that you're making, because I want to make sure that we can, um, you know, promote those appearances that you're that you have coming up. Um. But quickly, we were talking before we started recording about the new cover in Bulgarian. And this was, of course, the anniversary cover that came out a few years ago. Um, and I, I, I'm curious, you said there was a kind of a controversy surrounding this cover yes. in Bulgaria. So there was a big scandal, actually. Um, and uh yeah it was a bit of a riot situation once um, the covers came out people didn't uh, really like them and one of the reasons is is um the painter who is a very famous and honored bulgarian painter hadn't read or you know watched the movies so he had no idea what was going on and he was just you know i guess just told paint whatever um bit and that's how he interpreted so 
some covers didn't quite match the story uh didn't get the feel and um in general uh you know he was accused of painting something that looked as if a three-year-old had painted it and uh that was a big scandal but then it settled down and people relaxed a little and got used to the covers so when you're when you're walking around in stores in bulgaria do you see the new covers for sale or are they still selling older covers or is it a mix of of the two um there is a mix there is a mix okay obviously people you know have different preferences and these um you know the books have become collectibles now i've seen people collect different covers uh, so i guess you know this is part of the collection now oh yeah we know all about that about yeah. collecting the different <laughs> covers <laughs> Um, that's actually, we talk quite a bit on the show about what our collections are and what they entail, because there, is, there really is no like criteria, right? If you're collecting, um, I don't know if you're collecting like sports cards, right? Like baseball cards or football cards, like you can have like a set. We don't really have like a criteria of, of what a full collection of these mean, but I know the three of us all appreciate when there's a, a different art on the front, whether we like it or not, we just like that there's a different one to add to the collection that's just that just makes it a little bit more diverse i suppose when it comes to looking at the books so um there are ones that we favor over others like we i think we were talking before recording the this german cover you said you saw this a lot when you were in germany recently and how yes it's beautiful it's beautiful right um it's just a fantastic cover and the whole set is fantastic in our opinion but i'm sure there's probably someone out there that looks at that and says i don't like that I wish it was a little more. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So that's. I mean, you know, different people, different different views, different likes. And some people just prefer the traditional anyway. So anything new, they're not going to care for, regardless of how wonderful it is. That is also true. Yeah. Oh, and I'm I'm curious when you think of a Harry Potter book, which art do you think of? What comes to mind first? The original. Well, there is a purple set um purple covers uh all all books are um yes that's the one <laughs> oh johnny duddle mm -hmm. yes i quite like those we and like them too beautiful those are beautiful <laughs> covers and we never got those in the united states so i think all the copies we have are from england or other countries that was my first bulgarian copy that someone brought back to me from sofia when they were there for a figure skating event they brought me back a copy oh, of the nice. book yeah, it was really exciting. Um, so well, I guess before we move into that last thing about collecting, do you collect anything? Is there anything that you collect? Uh, yes, I've collected a lot of things um, over the years. Uh, I have a quite a collection of phone cards. You know, those yeah. cards that we used to have um, that you would stick in a payphone and right, right. use them. So I've got, you know, quite a collection of those. And you can probably see this yellow fella behind me. I've got quite a few minions. <laughs> so yeah, quite a few things. Are there anything? It's, it's, it's oh, go ahead. It's fun, you know. It's it's nice to have something to collect. And some people collect women. Some people collect, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I I imagine you do a lot of traveling right either for yes. for film work or for conventions or other or other harry potter related oh that's things. another thing i collect those um shot glasses as well that's the recent thing that i've started doing okay oh, that's cool uh, i've been seeing them at airports forever so i was like I, I might as well start collecting those and of course i've got three fridges full of magnets now <laughs> so uh well, it's, they're really cool it's... you know from all sort of different parts of the world are there any things that fans will consistently like give you at events that you either keep or, do, uh, or, or don't keep? Well, all of this behind me, you know, the Victor Crumb and Harry Potter stuff is uh, basically from fans. So I get a lot of paintings, a lot of um, minions as well. They know I collect them and I quite like, you know, minions and would have a huge army if I could have <laughs> minions army. Uh, so, yeah, they, you know, they're really nice and they give me a lot of um, fan art and Harry Potter memorabilia. 
I get a lot of those uh, little, well, quite a few, not a lot, quite a few of the Victor Crumb figures, the little pop ones, okay. the oh, big yeah. ones, but the, the small. Because obviously they double um, in those mystery, I think, mystery boxes oh, that they open. Right. Yeah, I so, know about um, those. <laughs> they come and they say, oh, I've got you. This is for you. You can have yourself. And like, that's really cool. When, and I just thought of this. You're the first person I've ever talked to that has a Lego minifigure of themselves. Do you have that? Well, that's quite cool, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's, yeah, right by that victor crumb goblin i think thing, i think know, the, the ones that they need that's how you know you've like done something very impactful you've is made when it. you can you can buy yourself in lego <laughs> form yeah that's really cool. i mean I, you can buy I, you, never in a million years i would have imagined i would see myself as a any figure you know well yeah <laughs> like a puppet or a doll well i mean you can buy johnny depp in lego and you can buy you in lego so that's, pretty cool. That's, that's pretty it. cool. And Harrison Ford, right? Bucket list right there. <laughs> right there. There you go. There you go. Um, so is there anything any, well, anything you want to mention from maybe the movies that we haven't talked about before we move into kind of what you're currently working on? Um, I don't know. Um, a lot of a lot of a lot has been said about the movies. Um, but there is always something that people come up with. I really like how passionate and knowledgeable fans are when it comes to trivia. This is something that has always impressed me. Like, you know, they come up with these specific details. They know the number of the page, the line, the detail, how many letters, words. It's incredible. You know, this always fascinated me. So I'm not very good at trivia and I, I try to avoid these specific things, but they are incredible. Also, um, another thing that's become quite big is uh, cosplaying. And Durmstrang is picking up pace. More and more Durmstrangs are, um, you know, being seen around the world as cosplays. And I really like that. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so speaking of conventions, um, have you been to any recently? Do you have any coming up that people should be paying attention to or getting tickets for? Uh, yeah, well, I'm coming to the States next year. Uh, that will be in August, Chicago. Oh, right. LeakyCon. Con. Cool. Yep. Uh, recently was in Denver for another LeakyCon. I uh, met a lot of awesome people. I uh, was at a convention in... Germany not too long ago, uh, Stuttgart, which was also really cool. And I've just come back from my Harry Potter event in Verona, Italy, and I'm going I soon to Lyon, France. And then I'll be home for Christmas and New Year's and all of that in a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah. Wild. Kind of. Not, not in a week, in a month, shall we say. Yeah. I've been on a little tour. Is that like, do you still enjoy doing that that quickly or does it ever feel like too fast? Well, sometimes it does feel way too fast. You know, by the time I arrive, I find myself already at the airport going home. Uh, so it, it takes time to sink in. But, you know, so many people come and see us, which is, you know, a huge honor. And time just flies by. I wish, you know, we could stretch time and have more time for everybody to, you know, enjoy and, you know, explore cities. And I have always had fans wanting to show me the, you know, their places around specific sightseeing and, you know, local dishes and all that kind of cultural discovering that I really love doing. But there is never enough time. I mean, 24 hours in a day uh, is not long enough. What are, what are some of your top destinations to go back to that you feel like you didn't really get to explore that you said, Hey, I really think this would be a cool spot to hang out for, for a few days. Um, I think, uh, Chile was one of those places. Uh, I didn't really see everything. And then Peru, uh, Europe, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm from Europe, so I travel on my motorcycle and I've seen a lot of that. Um, but yeah, Japan, 
just so many different places, you know, uh, so much to see around the world. So uh, it wouldn't, you know, maybe 10 lifetimes wouldn't be enough, <laughs> let alone a convention. Yeah. Time. <laughs> right. Well, fortunately, we talk about this all the time. Harry Potter is not going away. So as long as you're willing to go to these conventions, I think you're going to have ample opportunities to keep going to amazing places. Well, you know, this is the moment to thank all the Harry Potter fandom and fans for making this happen and, you know, continue this long. I mean, 20 years ago, books and films were made now and it's still ongoing. So we are very fortunate to have such a wonderful fans who keep this magic going. So huge thanks um, for them and to them, because if it wasn't for them, it wouldn't be us here today talking about this. So very fortunate. We have the best fans, as I say. Yay, fans! I'm a fan. I'll, I'll take the, I'll take that compliment well, personally. I think we we sort of all are, aren't we? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, so, just taking a step away from Harry Potter before we end this here, um, is there anything that you're currently working on that you're that you're excited about, or what, like what else are you doing out, uh, outside well, of the world I'm, of Harry Potter? I have a few things uh, I'm doing which I cannot really talk about. I'm being <laughs> screen tested currently okay. for something huge. Uh, if I get this, it'll be big news. Um, Victor, Victor Crumb, the untold uh, very, story. <laughs> yes. Um, we work on a couple of projects uh, for 2023, an action movie, a Western that we, God bless, get to film in Las Vegas as cool. well. I play a... Uh, uh, you know, it's a mini mini series, and I play a sweet, uh, lethal, really cool character. Uh, so yeah, got a few things down the pipeline, keeping the ball rolling, and excited for twenty twenty three. Very cool, Melanie. Awesome. Car Melanie or Carly, do you have any any final thoughts here? I've just been enjoying co the conversation so much that I'm really <laughs> engrossed in it. Actually, I know that's what I just like texted to our group. I was like where it's just very interesting because it's not often that we have someone from another country and obviously we're also interested in other countries. So um, just hearing you talk about your experience traveling so much is very cool. Something that we're probably a bit jealous of, but it's really like cool hearing your experience through Potter and how that brings you around the world in a different, completely different way from us. We experience it through all of our, translation so you get to actually go sometimes we get to go <laughs> it's exciting isn't it mm -hmm. it's yeah. um i love the fact that you know harry potter has become so global and has touched so many lives and you know hearing people's stories is is always fascinating how you know we technically doing our job have affected people's lives and, and changed lives for good for the good um which is really it's 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 a, it's a great honor you know being part of such a big thing that's awesome it is awesome well it was a great honor speaking with you yes. and could you do us one more great honor and would you be able to read the first paragraph of the book for us in bulgarian uh, yes, but I don't have it in front of me. I can I can hold uh, it up if you <laughs> if you make the screen bigger. <laughs> That's Let's one see. way to do it. <laughs> it's not a very long chap, not a very long paragraph. Oh, it's a very short paragraph. We uh, can't. There it is. There we go. So, um, from the beginning, right? Mumcheto kweto ojivia, the boy who lived. Well, I shouldn't be translating it. <laughs> Госпожа и господин Дърсли, живеещи на улица Привит Драйв. Why did they? See, this is, this is one of those translations. They didn't translate Private Drive, they said Привит Drive. Which would be, okay. Номер 4. С гордост твърдяха, че, слава Богу, са напълно нормални. Oh, this brings me back in time. <laughs> Wait, hold on, it just disappeared. Бяха от хората, от които най-малко ще очаквате да са замесени в нещо странно или загадъчно, защото просто не одобряваха такива глупости. 
господин Дърсли беше директор на фирма, наречена Grunings, която... Която произвеждаше дрелки. Беше едър на бит мъж, почти без врат. Но за това пък имаше много големи мустаци. Госпожа Дърсли бе слаба и руса. Двойно по-дълъг врат от обикновените вратове, което и вършеше something. We just lost him. We did. Well, hopefully he comes back. Okay, am I back? You're back. Okay, yeah. something happened and I disappeared. <laughs> oh, we, we thought you were just doing like a mic drop moment. Like, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, because I, I was clicking on the screen, I, I must have misclicked. Got it. Well, Stan, I think that's all all the questions we have. I really, really appreciate you coming on and taking the time to do this, with, especially with all your busy traveling. And I mean, you absolutely did not have to come on the Dialogue Alley podcast, but here you are. Oh, no, so, thank you for having me. It's, really, it's really been, appreciate it. It's been good fun. Melanie, Carly, any final thoughts? No, just well, thank you so thing. much. Thank you. Uh, thank you and keep the magic going. <laughs> that's the plan. <laughs> Awesome. All right, guys. So for our translation of the show today, we are going to be obviously talking about Harry Potter in Bulgarian. Um, we've already talked about that anniversary edition with Stan. So, and we've done it as a translation Thank of the you. show. So today we're going to talk about the first date, which is Mary Grand Prey cover art. Um, I have a hard cover. What do you guys have? Hard. I have both. But I'll, I'll bring the hard. The hard is definitely my favorite between the two. It's so well made. But we'll get into that later. We will. This was, a, I think, this is the most recent Bulgarian book that I have acquired. I, I've got a Johnny Duddle cover first, then I got yeah. the an, then I got the and anniversary I have an adult one book cover too. I think. Yeah, but this was I actually the last one, and I, I might have gotten this from you, Carly. You did. I think I did because I was like, well, might as well, and it's easy, and Carly's <laughs> selling it, so got it. <laughs> yeah, you did. I love, I love the. Well, we'll get into it. I'm just going to preface and say I love these books. Okay, go on. Me too. Well, we've already talked about <laughs> uh, Bulgarian as a language in that episode where we did cover that um, anniversary edition in depth. So I don't think we need to talk right. anymore about no. that as well. Just mentioning again that Bulgarian is written in the Cyrillic alphabet. So if you look at it, it's going to look very similar to a bit other. different. Well, it's going to look different to us. But if you are looking at other like Eastern European languages like Russian, Ukrainian, um, Sometimes Bosnian, not 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 Bosnians, um, Ser Serbian. There we go. Not Bosnian, <laughs> Serbian. Um, we have a lot of books that are written in <laughs> in the Cyrillic alphabet. So uh, this is one where if you don't necessarily speak that language, I have a hard time like just on immediate viewing. Like, oh, that's that's Bulgarian, or oh, that's uh, that's Bosnian, or not Bosnian. Why do I keep saying Bosnian? That's <laughs> Serbian. You know. So um, yeah, just that's that's what it looks like. It's it's the Cyrillic alphabet. Yeah, um, and this book in particular is translated by the same translator as the 20th anniversary. So it's Teodora Zebrova and published by Egmont Group. Um, so yeah, uh, so on a scale of one to five, with five being the most difficult, how hard would you say it is to get this book? For the Grand Prix hardcover, I'd say between a yeah. two and a half and a three. Yeah, I, I think I've I feel comfortable with that. I would say probably about like a two and a half. Is good. Like they're definitely around, but they're not usually around in your bigger e-commerce places. So you usually have to look at like Facebook, Bulgaria marketplace. Yeah. Especially because that anniversary book that we just talked about with Stan is the newest version of that. Yes. That, right. that, that book's everywhere. And I was surprised when he mentioned that the Johnny Duddle cover one is still pretty popular. And that's the one that he sees a lot too. 
Yeah, that's so yeah. cool. Um, I love the Duddle Bulgarian. I also feel like just for me personally, like I'd prefer unique cover art. So I know for me, I'd rather get that if I'm only collecting one, I would prefer to get the unique cover art with the 20th anniversary. However, oh, yeah, definitely. like I need, I need the first edition. Like I try to get first editions with everything. So that's why I have to have Mary Grant Prey on there. Um, and then what would you say for value? Um, I typically, I think I sold the one that Eric has for between 50 and 60. And I think that's, they're holding firm around in there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I'd agree with that. I think I got mine for like 30 back in the day, but that was like several years ago. Yeah, um, I think I vaguely remember when you got yours. And I think you got a pretty good deal if I remember properly. Yeah. We'll talk about that later because I can mm. tell you the whole story. Oh, great. <laughs> I remember it being a mess. It was a story. It was definitely a story. <laughs> um, all right, let's open this book up and give it a whiff. Because again, if you guys are new to our podcast, um, we do a whole rating scale. We call it the top scale. Translation um, which, of the show. It's an abbreviation. Right, right. So the top scale is just little ways that we analyze each book. And we do this every episode. So uh, open this up, take it a, a little whiff. I like oh. it. I like it too. I'm like exceeds expectation yes, with that. Exceeds yeah. me, me too. Give it an E for E from Eric. E for me. It's got a nice sweet, like sweetness to it, especially around the spine where the, all the glue is. Yeah. Oh yeah. You got to dig your nose like real deep into these Ooh. books. Ooh. Ooh, Eric just made such a face. <laughs> <laughs> um, size and proportion of this book. Also, I would give, I'd give it an outstanding, honestly. Definitely wow. an outstanding. Right? I it's love so this book. It's so good. It's like very thin very tall slightly narrow like it's, it's so definitely perfect. stand out yeah it's no it's perfect it's, it's awesome yeah it's definitely an, uh outstanding for me i i've i got this book very early in my collecting career and it set the bar very high i mean very high i was gonna say like e but boy those like really good comments i mean i agree with all of them so if i agree with all of them <laughs> does that mean it's an o so I think so. So I guess I'll go I home agree. also. Perfect. Look at the three O's. It, it really is great. Yeah, it is. I love it. Um, and also the size and proportions lead it to feel really awesome in your hands, guys. Mm -hmm. um, I love how the color, like the, the cover, the slickness of it. I love yeah, how it feels in my hand. It's funny because we were just talking about the Norwegian cover and how like almost slimy that cover is. This book is still glossy, but it doesn't feel weird. Um, no. It's a very nice texture. And I feel like the thinness of the book makes it feel awesome in your hands. I would give it an exceeds expectations. I'm not quite outstanding, but I would say still awesome. I'm going to say exceeds expectations as well, simply because while it is still super wonderfully glossy, it is still prone to like some of those minor rubs, not as prone as some other covers we've Girl, talked about. Girl, that's quality. Still, but I don't like how it feels in my hand when I feel those. Because do you feel like the residual rubs? I do feel the residual okay, so that, rubs. There, so I don't like how that feels. That's where I was going. I don't like how that feels in my hand. All so right. that's why it's an exceeds expectations otherwise and it doesn't even do it as bad as some but otherwise it would have been like an outstanding for me but it is like an e plus i i'm gonna go exceeds expectations i don't know if it's quite outstanding for me we didn't mention this is a hardcover book but it does not have a jacket so when we're talking right. about like how it, how it feels it's just straight up image printed on the on the cover like on the boards itself so um, I like the I like the feel of the paper in this book. Um, it's I don't know. I, there's just nothing about it that's an outstanding for me. Like when when I feel those hard Slovak books, like oh, I know. that the that, buttery, that that to me yeah. is an outstanding. The, the, even the Belarusian. Yeah, that to yeah. me is an outstanding like feel in my hand with a book without a dust jacket. And this book doesn't quite live up to that yet. It's still really good. It feels very sturdy and like, yes. Like it's gonna yeah. hold together really well. I know it's kind of quality, but it feels in my well, hand like a quality right. book. So I'm gonna give let's it an E. Okay, so let's talk about quality because I feel like everything we were saying kind of delves into that too. I the I'm gonna give mine and exceeds expectations for quality only because I feel like my cover has come slightly separated from the pages. Like, do you guys yeah. see that? 
That seems oh. to be very common with those with the books that I've seen out of Bulgaria, though. So I think it's in how they're made. I think it honestly um, depends on how many times it's been read, too, because if you look yeah. like it's it's one of those books where, yeah, it's bound well on the spine, but it still all depends on how good that connection is between it, like it's the end paper, I guess, that's yeah. affixed right. to the boards because it's one of those books that doesn't have a jacket and like they really have to kind of. Right. And I think it's actually a testament because I've seen diff I've had many different hardcover Bulgarian books over the years that I've sold and swapped out my copies for others. And I've had some that have been really well read and some that were brand new. And I can honestly say the really well read ones tended to hold up very well. So I think it's a very good quality book. I'm going to I'm going to give it an E. I've certainly okay. seen much, much, much worse. But there's nothing just outstanding about quality. But I will say I've seen them be read and the spine does not lean super a lot, which says a lot. Like even our scholastic hardcovers here, you read them once and the spine is like wonky janked. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, no, with I, every think it's good. I agree with everything you said. My pages are getting a little yellow, but again, it's an yeah. older book. It's the first version of this book. It's been around for a while. Right. So like, like I we, think they were 2001 or 99 or something yeah, like a long time. Mm -hmm. Over 20 yeah, years ago. Around. And if if book pages haven't started to yellow just a little bit after 20, 20 years, like some alien I mean, technology is being used. Is it even real? Like at that point, I think we get into the whole thing, the, the argument that we get into with like McDonald's food. If it hasn't started to grade after six months, is it even real food? Probably not. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that the pages yellowing is just, it's just going to be a It's just a naturally. It's a, it's a, it's a book, right? It's yeah. unless you vacuum seal it in something, it's a book. It's going to start to yellow over time. Um, and then interpretation of the cover art. Um, obviously, it's the Mary Grand Prix cover art. I feel like the way that they fit the text into the image is really well done. So for an interpretation, I would give it an exceeds expectations. I really like how it looks. I'm going to say probably an outstanding from me because 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 i thought long and hard about it i love how they did it i love the glossiness that they used for the paper that they wrapped around the boards and i really like how they did the hair the big harry potter font across the top it is not in foil it is not even like a flat yellow but the way that it is still textured on the cover like adds more dimension and depth to everything and i really enjoy that like this is probably absolutely one of my favorite hardcover um grand prix translations so outstanding I, for me i agree with a, a lot of what you said but like melanie i i don't really love how they fit it into the really? archway yeah i, I think love it's that i think it's packed in really tight like there is no room for air on the top or bottom with the archway and the and character like i don't like that it sits there and is in between the archway i like how it the fits space. with like the p like See, I, that's, that. I like that. Yeah, yeah I, do I like that, but I wish it was a little bit taller. I don't know. I love it. I can't give it an outstanding. I don't even know if I can give it an exceeds expectations. This might be the most divisive oh, rating wow. of the whole thing. I'm going to give it an A. I well, think it. Well, I think it does a good job of doing it, and that's acceptable <laughs> for me. I don't. It, there's nothing on there wow. that makes it more than acceptable for me. Interesting. To me, it's fine. It's totally fine. Nothing bad. There's nothing bad. It is a totally fine adaptation of the Grand Prix art. So yeah. I'm giving it an acceptable. All right. I'll accept your acceptable. Um, so overall, awesome book. Um, if I had to choose between the unique cover art of the 20th anniversary and the Mary Grand Prix, I think I would still choose the unique 20th anniversary art. I happen to love it, even though we found out that it was a bit scandalous. Yeah. Um, but still, both are amazing. Like, what good books. And it was so awesome getting to chat with Stan about these books. For sure. Yeah, it was. So with all of that being said, that is all the time that we have for this episode of Dialogue Alley. If you would like to get in touch with us and ask us any questions, you can reach out to us on Instagram. You can find Carly at All the Pretty Books, Eric at Nocturne Eric, or you can find me at the Harry Potter Collection. 
Um, if you want, you can also check out our websites. You can find pictures of anything that we've been chatting about on those. So you can find Carly's at alltheprettybooks.net. Mine is theharrypottercollection.com. And you can also go to dialoguealley.com where we have images of our translation of the show. Um, but you could also go to the Dialogue Alley Instagram, which we talk about, or we'll have images of all of the books that we chatted about today. But there are also other social media platforms that you can find us on. We're on Twitter at Dialogue underscore Alley. We're on Facebook. Um, you can find me on TikTok at the Harry Potter Collection. Remember, you can also find Dialogue Alley on any of your podcast hosting locations on Apple, on Google, on Spotify, on Audible, Pandora. You can ask Alexa. She will play our podcast for you. Any of those places would be awesome. Um, and if you like what you're listening to, if you leave us a review, that is always super helpful. We love to read new reviews on our podcast. So that would be great. And one of our favorite places that you can find us on is MuggleNet. And we are part of the MuggleNet family of podcasts. We are super excited about it. And we cannot wait to share more awesome MuggleNet type fun things with you guys. Um, but if you're looking to support our podcast even a bit further, we also have a Patreon, which is www.patreon.com slash Dialogue Alley. That's where you can have access to ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and access to our Discord, which is full of resources and all sorts of awesome extra content. Um, so with that being said, it is now time to walk back. Oh, hold on one second. Yes, Eric. Well, we have to once again thank Stan Yanevsky for being on the show. I know, but he can't say you're welcome. And we thanked him a million I know, times the other but, day. But we can say, if you want to check his Instagram out, you can go find oh, him at Stan um, underscore Yanevsky. And like I we talked about, that. like we talked about with him, Yanevsky is now spelled with a Y, right? We, that, so that's a little different. He had to change all of his social media handles. So you can go to Stan underscore Yanevsky. It's got a blue check mark by him. You know it's him if it's got the blue check mark. So... You can uh, go follow him on Instagram if you want to find out more of what he's up to and learn more about his uh, upcoming projects and get a little more peeks into his travels because he does post a lot of cool travel pictures on there too. So with all of that being said, now it is time to walk back through the archway and into your daily lives and we will catch you next time. Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye.